Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this early to, for, to attend this exciting event. We are excited about the Tropical Soybean for Development Workshop. Um, this workshop has been organized by the Soybean Innovation Lab, which is one of our research programs that have been awarded last year to the University of Illinois and the director of lab, Dr. Peter Goldsmith, with us here today. And if you want to learn more about the Soybean Innovation Lab or more about soybean, tropical soybean, you can visit the website uh, soybeaninnovationlab.illinois.edu or follow their Twitter handle at Tropical Soy Lab. And as B told me, the Twitter does not provide dating advice. It is more about soybean and science. So it is a good portal for this kind of information. Um, today's event focus on the need of soybean practitioner to become successful developer for soybean. And as we all know, soybean is not a native crop for Africa, practitioner farmers operating in the tropics. Soybean is commercial and stable crop that is foreign to current agriculture portfolios in a small and medium holders. And uh, during this workshop, we will learn more about tropical soybean for development, about some of the challenges, and about the problems that, and potential solution for them. Uh, our first speaker, is Dr. Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist, Bureau of Food Security at USAID. Please join us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bertram. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Ahmed. Okay, so I'm all set. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by saying that, um, besides that it's a pleasure to be here, that um, I really have, uh, what I'm gonna say this morning, I, I, I got a lot of good uh, support and ideas over the last year from Dr. Goldsmith, other colleagues in the lab, and from Dr. Kablan. Um, and I have a number of slides that I cribbed from Pete. And I said to Pete, Pete, I feel funny you know, showing your slides. And he said, no, no, that's OK. You're supposed to be the integrator here this morning. So I hope that my humility will shine through the fact that I'm using all these other people's work. So, um, and, and so, uh, but I want to more seriously, I want to start out quickly, we have about 20 minutes, I think. I want to start out quickly with some context of why, you know, what's the context around this, the larger efforts that we're involved in in Feed the Future. And then I think move on to the, the, the new ground of the, the Soybean Innovation Lab and why we're so excited about it. It's really a 21st century agricultural development program in many ways, and I hope that I can uh, flag some of those for you. So this, is, this slide, if you look at that, there's nothing particularly new in terms of insights. In fact, I could have been standing here 10 years ago and shown you all these same points, and the world was doing very little. In fact, the world was busy disinvesting in agricultural development during that period, even though we knew this. Um, and we knew, we had an evidence base to show what in, a good investment agricultural R&D is, and it still didn't change the, the, the situation in terms of the agriculture and food being on the back burner of the development agenda. So I think everybody by now knows what happened in uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, food once again became front page news. We saw civil unrest disorder in maybe up to 30 countries. Uh, there was a lot of debate about what was causing this. Was it drought? Was it biofuels increasing demand? Was it policies around low stocks? And probably all of these were factors, but in a relatively small way, what we found instead is that we were in a, a new era of higher prices. This is not a spike. I mean, the prices have fluctuated still, but they are still well over what they had been in the early part of the last decade in, and in prior years. 
And we think there are two major factors. Uh, one is the demand shift that's associated with income growth, and particularly to, towards feed intensive foods, so your animal source foods in particular as incomes rise. So demand was racing ahead of population growth. But the second thing, was, which uh, I think was less obvious to people, was the point that Ken Kasman likes to make, that what we've had for the last 40 or so years is linear growth in our main commodities. Uh, so these are what rice, wheat, and maize. In other words, the same increment year on year. But what that means is that what was almost a 3% growth rate in the 1960s is now just over 1%. And that declining rate of productivity growth undercuts a lot of the kinds of development gains that we saw in the early days of the Green Revolution in terms of keeping prices low. In fact, making prices, real prices, lower so that poor people had more money in their pockets every day. Because if you're spending 70% of your money on food, which is not uncommon, if, price, if food prices go down in a real sense, you're your expend, uh, disposable income increases. If the opposite occurs, which is what's happened in recent years, you get a big pinch, which is why we saw these, these riots break out as people saw their gains eroding rapidly. Um, now, the good news is that the way to deal with this is through R&D. In other words, we can up the curve there. We can push that curve up. And I would put forward to you that soy is a great case in point. Soy is a crop which has enjoyed continuing strong R&D. And I believe that the growth rate, Pete, you correct me if I'm wrong, is something over 2% with soy. So I mean, you, you can see very real differences associated with how much the global community is willing to invest in these critical food commodities. So, just sort of summing up, this was a, a slide from Mark Rosegrant at, at IFPRI. We have these challenges, which we've also already mentioned there at the top, that can be driving uh, the food price uh, situation. We have critical natural resource challenges, and we have uh, this issue of reinvesting in R&D, reversing years of disinvestment, and I think very importantly to feed the future and to the Soybean Innovation Lab is linking these changes, these, these investments in R&D and capacity building allied to that to on the ground impact and, and, and helping really show that we can make that change and justify uh, our, our way forward. So beginning in 2009 when he took office, the president launched uh, the Feed the Future initiative as part of the G8. Uh, Feed the Future is an all of government effort, so USDA, Millennium Challenge Corporation, State Department, Peace Corps are all partners with us. And um, we are the three, three billion, that was for three years, a billion or so a year piece of a $22.5 billion G8 commitment that was made in L'Aquila in Italy. Um, I wanted to flag two of these. One of them I have highlighted, three, because that's the R&D piece that I think is right at the heart of the work of the lab. But also take your attention to number six, which is about improved access to food and, and nutrition services. So this is the, the, the thrust of Feed the Future that is as much about nutrition and in nutrition enhancement as it is about growth, uh, traditional growth from agricultural uh, development. I want to say a little bit on the how. This is the what Feed the Future does. The how, a few points, country-led. That means if our partner countries don't think it's a priority and they're not investing in it, we probably shouldn't either. Uh, a second point is that we have three cross-cutting areas. One is gender, which again, uh, critically important to, to the nutrition outcomes, but also as women are uh, economic agents in the agricultural development process and leaders of all, throughout the, uh, throughout the um, set of uh, expertises that are required. And then this approach on value chains, which is also very much uh, uh, the, the central focus for most of our mission programs overseas. And we have 19 focus missions. 12 of those are in sub-Saharan Africa. Finally, the, on this, the metrics for Feed the Future are, were 
very high level objectives, and it's very interesting because one is poverty reduction, which maybe isn't a surprise for those of us in ag research. The other is reduction in stunting in children under two, which is an enormous lift for those who are involved in agricultural R&D. And it speaks to the importance of making uh, 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 nutrition objectives absolutely in the center and outcomes absolutely in the center of the whole initiative. So what did we do on the research side? We basically overlay child stunting data with poverty data. And what we find out is that four geographies really pop out. Uh, and, and poverty and hunger, and this is sometimes counterintuitive, are concentrated in these bread baskets and rice bowls of the world. That's where the people are, that's where the poverty and hunger is. So we're not ignoring Latin America, we're not ignoring the Middle East, we have research programs in particular and policy programs that speak to those areas, we have focused countries in Central America, but the magnitude of the challenge in terms of both stunting and poverty is dwarf, elsewhere that's dwarfed by the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia in terms of the sheer numbers of people involved. So then with these four geographies, which overlap to a very good degree our, our focus countries, and you can see the, the, in Africa we have the Ethiopian highlands, the eastern and southern Africa mixed maize based systems and the Sudano-Sahelian zone across West Africa. Uh, across these, we had three major themes emerge. One was traditional agricultural research, advancing the productivity frontier, you know, vaccines, breeding and genetics, genomics, uh, the, the things that are really out there in terms of pushing that yield frontier. The second thing was the transforming key production systems. And that's this idea that if we're going to solve hunger and poverty, we've got to help uh, smallholders in these agri major agricultural systems improve their, their livelihoods, their returns to land, labor, and capital. And the third is this uh, nutrition and food safety. And um, soy actually, I think, has a, a very key role to play in all three of those objectives. So when, at AID, then, we took those larger goals and thought about, well, what are our uh, where should we make our investments? So we have three long-term investment areas, climate resilient cereals, advanced research on pests and diseases of plants and animals, and this is where we can leverage, say, uh, uh, science from the Danforth Center in St. Louis into cassava to combat brown streak in Africa, even though we don't have cassava programs. The third is this idea of, of, of really investing in legume productivity. And, and legume productivity is important for many reasons. I think the biggest driver was the fact that legumes have such an important food quality aspect. And, and, but they also have very attractive aspects economically and, of course, environmentally. Then we had three cross-cutting areas. The Safe and Nutritious Foods Program, uh, again, reflecting back to, say, the legumes or, or possibly the livestock and the animal disease and that sort of thing. Uh, policy uh, and markets, institutional kinds of uh, 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 policy and market support and, and, and analysis and research, and then the program for human and institutional capacity development. And I might mention that one of those programs is actually led by the University of Illinois. That's the, our modernizing um, Extension and Advisory Services, and I see Suzanne Poland, who's the manager of that program. Um, so we have those, and then they all come together in something we call sustainable intensification. And this is the idea that uh, uh, you put, you, you, you deal with the natural resource issues, you deal with the, the human capacity, the policy, the market issues, and you integrate your component technologies and that's what gives you the underpinning for a transformation of the system. And if you think about it, um, soy is absolutely critical in legumes. It's critical in the quality food and nutrition outcome. And it's critical, in my view, in the sustainable